This episode is sponsored by Brilliant. Learn to think. This is a bizarre story about sex, sacrifice, clones, cannibals. There's even a parade. But we'll get to that in a minute. Here is where our story begins. This is a single spore of Dictyostelium discoidium, let's call it Dicky, and it's just about to hatch. Dicky is found in the dirt pretty much everywhere, but it's not an animal or a plant or a fungus. It's a real bitch clue for 20 questions, I'll tell you that. Dicky is a cellular slime mold, and it goes about this whole life thing a bit differently. Dicky emerges from the spore as a single cell, a type of cell called an amoeba. Inside it has a single set of genes in a little ball called a nucleus. But Dicky is very small, so here's some larger amoebae so we can have a better look. It looks a bit like a sneeze, but not just any sneeze. It's the one that comes on suddenly while you're eating. There's little bits in it. To move, amoebas can change their shape to create pseudopodia or false feet. They look a bit flat under a microscope, but think of them as a ball that can gouge out in any direction. That's right, gouge. Now these amoeba are born hungry and ready to hunt. This one's going after bacteria, those little spaghetti noodles. Oop, oh, that one got away. They don't have a mouth or a brain. I mean, come on, they're a single cell. So to eat, they surround their prey and pull them inside of their body. It's somewhere between a hug and a horror film. Now you should know, you have very similar cells all throughout your body. Here's one. It's a kind of white blood cell called a macrophage. It crawls around and eats up things that aren't supposed to be there. Anyway, back to our Dicky. After a little snack, Dicky divides into two. It makes a copy of its nucleus where its genetic material is stored and then sort of pinches itself off like a loaf. And then it's like, good luck, Richard. Oh, thanks, Richard. It was fun being you. I mean, us. Whatever. Later. And they go their separate ways. And then they eat and then they divide. And pretty soon you've got a whole sitload of them and guess what? They've eaten all the food. Now here's where it gets weird. When Dictyostelium discoidium runs out of food, something remarkable happens. The hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of individual amoeba stop eating, stop dividing, and do this. Look at it! It's crazy, they all come back together! Before we go any further, here's a refresher on how we do it. We start off as two single cells. There's a sperm cell that has a nucleus with a set of genes in it from your biological father. It can't eat, can't make copies of itself. It can move a little, but once it's out there, it doesn't just all spontaneously come back together. Imagine waking up to that. <laughs> Slip and break your ankle. The other cell is an egg cell that has a nucleus with genetic material from your biological mother. You know, mom genes kill me. It's only when those two cells meet and combine their nuclei into one that this new cell can start dividing. But when it makes copies of itself, they don't go off willy-nilly. They stick together in the little ball, and it keeps dividing and eventually turns into all sorts of different cells. And that's how animals do it, from mosquitoes to sea urchins to us. Certainly not this crazy Deadpool shit. Anyway, let me explain what's going on here. It starts with a single amoeba, usually one that's already in a cluster with other amoebae nearby. This starving cell starts to release a pulse every six minutes or so of a chemical messenger called cyclic AMP. This burst of chemicals diffuses and spreads out through the environment. When it reaches other amoebae, two things happen. One, the cells move in the direction of the rising chemical concentration. The other thing they do is they give off their own burst of cyclic AMP. As this signal spreads throughout the population of Dickies, it begins to form waves and spiral patterns that are so beautiful they can almost look fake. These waves of chemical attractants guide the amoebae into streams that flow towards a number of different aggregation centers. As new amoebae join the stream, they attach themselves to their neighbors. You can see them moving forward in a kind of rhythmic pulse. They are very much individuals, though, and if at this point they came across food, they would go their separate ways. As these streams come together, they break up into little blobs of around 100,000 cells, all swirling around. And then they do something remarkable. They start to sort themselves. Cells that are more malnourished or that have just recently divided, essentially the weaklings, rise to the top of these little mounds and form a sort of finger only a couple millimeters wide. That finger eventually falls over, and then the whole thing starts to move. Look at all the ones on the bottom that missed the boat. <laughs> and there they go, with the weak ones up front leading the way. And they're all like, woohoo, we're the leaders. It really doesn't end well for them, though. But we'll get to that after a brief message about our sponsor. Brilliant is a wonderful tool for learning science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or STEM, as the hip kids like to say. 
Now, I find the best way to learn is to play around a bit with concepts at my own pace, and that is exactly what Brilliant lets you do. But if it was you, you would do it at your pace, not my pace. You get it. They have interactive lessons where you can test your instincts about all sorts of real-world phenomena. And while you do that, you learn some of the fundamental concepts that make our world so friggin' interesting to live in. You might already be familiar with things like geometry or calculus, but Brilliant offers you new ways to approach and understand these topics in a way that's stress-free and fits your schedule. Trust me, the world becomes more interesting the more interested you are in it. Learn something new. To get started for free, visit brilliant.org slash Z-E-F-R-A-N-K or click on the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Try it. I'm a fan and happy to have them as a sponsor. Where were we? Oh right, <laughs> this crazy thing that looks a bit like sentient ejaculate. This slug, as the science hippies call it, looks like it's one thing, but it's actually a collection of individuals moving together. But these individuals that were more or less identical to start begin to change a bit. The ones up front, the first 20% or so of the slug, become more active as they lead the way, searching for the perfect combination of temperature, light, and acidity. These cells in the front of what can look like runaway dog peni also secrete a mucus that envelops the slug. Sort of a tube-like snot condom that the slug moves through and that collapses behind it. In the back 80% of the slug, the cells are more mellow and sort of just follow along. This 1 to 4 ratio of cells in the front to cells in the back is very important. If things get wonky, cells will change from one type to the other to maintain the balance. For example, this slug here just had its front part amputated, and you can watch as cells from the back switch types to create a new front. When this little slug, made up of around 100,000 individual amoeba, finds just the right spot, it stops and forms a little mound. Of death, you'll see. The cells that were in the front of the slug, those cocky little bastards, move to the top of the mound. And then the whole thing does a little dump squat, compressing towards the ground for a moment. Now during that time, cells inside the mound collaborate to create a little tube or sheath out of cellulose. You can see it right there. As it squats, it pushes that tube down and fixes it to the ground. Now here's the crazy part. The amoebae that were in the front of the slug and led this whole posse to the perfect place climb down into that tube and sacrifice themselves. It's not pretty either. They start to kind of digest their own insides and they use the parts to create a sort of balloon or vacuole inside of themselves. This vacuole draws in water and swells up, and when it's gotten to a certain size, the amoeba hardens its outsides by creating a cell wall just like a plant do. So that tube in the middle of the mound starts to become a rigid stalk made out of dead bodies, and it keeps growing upwards as more and more cells sacrifice themselves. Now the cells on the outside, the ones that were in the back of the slug, they go through their own changes. Instead of swelling up and destroying themselves, they become smaller and rounder. They essentially turn into little eggs or spores. This slimy glob of spore cells is lifted up into the air as stalk cells continue to sacrifice themselves, swelling up inside the tube and creating an upward force. Now this goes on looking like a blown up condom until there aren't any stalk cells left and this ball of spores is suspended high in the air, soon drying out and waiting to be dispersed to places where there might be more food. It's quite an achievement, especially from the perspective of a solitary amoeba. So here's the question. Why would a self-sufficient amoeba that has the ability to turn into a stalk cell or a spore cell sacrifice itself in order to let another amoeba live on? I know what you're thinking, you smarty little chicken nipple. If these amoeba are clones of one another, then they're sacrificing themselves for, well, themselves. But here's the thing, they're not all clones of each other. So when they send that cool chemical signal out to aggregate, unrelated amoebae and even amoebae from different species respond to the call. So even though these amoebae seem to prefer to link up with their clones, they end up in a slug with clones of a different amoeba. And sometimes there's cheating, where one family of clones doesn't contribute to the stalk as much as the other. But apparently it's worth it to join up with as many amoeba as possible. Bigger slug, bigger stalk, more chances that your genes will be passed on. Watch down here, there's little tiny slugs trying to make their own stalks. Now I know what you're thinking, Smarty Puckerbottom. How can there be amoeba with different genes if all they do is make copies of themselves? Well, these little dickies can also have sex. 
If one amoeba comes across another amoeba that is not a version of itself and is sexually compatible, they merge, just like our sperm and egg cell. And then it just does some normal shit. Just kidding. This new cell sends out that same chemical signal that it uses when it's starving. When nearby amoebae are like, oh cool, we're making a slug and come closer, it freaking eats them. It eats a whole bunch of them, grows real big, and then walls itself off into something called a macrocyst. And then inside the macrocyst, it makes a whole bunch of new amoebae with new combinations of genes. Complain about your dating life all you want, but at least it's not like that. Imagine if your instinct was to have sex, order pizza, and then eat the delivery boy. What do you mean, what kind of pizza was it, Jerry? It doesn't matter, you're eating, the well, meat lovers. No, wait, vegetarian, for the irony. Or, hold on, <laughs> you order the stuffed pizza, have the delivery boy eat it, and then eat the stuffed delivery boy. Well, of course you could get a side of ranch, Jerry. Dip his toes in it. 